Phineas and Ferb is now 10 years old, meaning that those of you who grew up watching it are now ready to enter the dating scene. So in the hopes of helping you find your own true Isabella, it's time to welcome you back to Matt Pat's Guide to Finding the One, Animal Magnetism Magnificator Edition. Hey baby, is there a magnet in your pants? Cause my magnetism magnificator can't resist your buns of steel. Have you seen Perry? Is that the name of your platypus? No. Oh. Oh! Hey girl, has anyone ever told you that you're a real babinator with your settings cranked up to stunning? What you doing? You. <laughs> internet welcome to film theory the show that looks at the animated characters who do crazy science and does even crazier science off their work today i'm returning to the world of phineas and ferb which we did an episode on a couple months back if you haven't seen that one definitely go check it out we basically prove that dr doofenshmirtz is secretly the good guy a sleeper agent for the owca episode is linked in the upper right hand corner of the screen so if you're so excited that you need to go watch it right now well then you know where to find it otherwise just click the link at the end of the video. But even though that episode talked about how old Dr. Doof's not such a bad guy after all, it doesn't mean that he's not without a few flaws. Hey, we've all got our shortcomings, but it just so happens to be that Dr. Doofenshmirtz's weakness is literally his entire job. Starting from the very beginning, episode one of the series, we see how this so-called evil scientific genius basically doesn't even science, bro. This guy has hundreds of inventions over the course of the series, but the magnetism Magnificator from the pilot episode is not only the first that we see, but it's also the one that gets referenced time and time again over the next four seasons. Quickly! We must separate the magnet from the Magnificator before it is too late! Is it just me, or is this a serious deja vu moment? I feel like I've totally been here before, like... That's it, Agent P. You've got to get to that time machine and go back to the past. Right before that giant tinfoil ball puts you in a full body cast for 18 months. Basically, the Magnetic Magnificator is a super strong magnetic laser that somehow sucks in a magnetic field on one end, amplifies it on the other, and manages to shoot it directly at a target, which in this case happens to be all the skyscrapers on the eastern seaboard. Dr. Doof's plan is to cover that entire part of the country in tinfoil, and then use the Magnetism Magnificator to pull on the skyscrapers on the east coast so that everything on the east is pulled towards the west. His goal is to ultimately reverse the rotation of the Earth. Why would he want to reverse the rotation of the Earth? Well, that's a bit up in the air. You may well ask yourself, why would he do this? Well, let me just answer that by saying I haven't really worked out all the bugs yet. I mean, you know, the tin boy alone cost a lot. But is Dr. Doof's most infamous invention of the entire series a scientific success, or just a load of electromagnetic excrement? Well, it seems like his invention is a complete disaster in every way. Today's episode actually looks at the science behind the Magnetic Magnificator to reveal just how advanced Doof is, and probably more accurately, how smart the creators of the show were when they were designing this thing. And then, I'll just talk about the critical flaw that makes this whole thing fall apart. So get ready, today is gonna be one polarizing episode polarizing episode. You get it? Because it's like, get it? Like magnets? Hey, look, okay, I haven't covered magnets on this channel before, okay? So I got a lot of pent-up puns to unleash. So even though he doesn't know why he's doing it, it's clear that Doof wants to reverse the rotation of the Earth. But already there's a huge problem with that. Pretty much the first thing you learn in physics is the concept of closed systems. Yeah, dust off like the first ten pages of your high school physics textbook for this one. In this case, the eastern seaboard that Doof is shooting the Magnificator at and his own headquarters are both part of what's known as a closed system. According to classical physics, exerting a force inside a closed system doesn't change anything about the system relative to its surroundings. In easier to understand terms, if Doof's goal is to change the rotation of the Earth in space, he's never gonna do that by shooting one thing on the Earth at another thing that is still on the Earth. Trying to do this would be like trying to move a car by putting a moving tire inside the vehicle. Nothing is gonna change. The only way for a car to move is for it to exert force against 
against something external, like the road. By the same token, the only way to move an object like the Earth through space is for the object to exert a force against something outside of itself. When you're able to do that, that's what's known as an open system. But in order for magnets to affect anything about the Earth's rotation, he'd need to be aiming the magnifinator at the planet next door, not just some tin foil a few buildings away. As a lazy tailor would say, Suit yourself! But okay, so the cat's out of the bag that he can't change the rotation of the Earth. But maybe he could have done something else interesting with the Magnifinator instead. As it turns out, at the time of the premiere episode of Phineas and Ferb, Dr. Doofenshmirtz was actually eight years ahead of time with the Magnifinator. And that's no joke. Believe it or not, astrophysicists have spent most of the last decade trying to catch up to exactly what you see him doing in this episode. You think that's nuts? Let's take a closer look at the Magnetic Magnifinator to see just what's going on here. On the one end, you have this huge magnet, which seems to make sense if you're trying to suck the buildings right off the pavement with magnetism. But if you know anything about magnetism, you're probably going to notice two huge problems right off the bat. The first is that regular magnets don't have directionality. Sure, they have poles, but that doesn't make them directional. You can't just point a magnet like a gun and go, bang! I just shot you really hard with this magnetic field. When you create a magnet, it honestly just kind of sits there and emanates a magnetic field all around itself. It's not exactly all that threatening. Now problem two is even bigger. Even if he has a strong magnet over here, it's not gonna do anything to those buildings over there. Magnetic strength works by the inverse cube law, which means that as two magnetic objects get farther and farther away, their attraction drops off exponentially. An object that's twice as far away from a magnet will require eight times as much strength to attract it. Increase that distance by 10 times, and now you're gonna need to increase the strength of the magnet by a thousand times to compensate. Dr. Doofenshmirtz is trying to use his magnet to pull on buildings a kilometer away, which is basically impossible for any magnet that exists on Earth. The strongest magnet that currently exists in the world today is located at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory in Florida, which has a magnetic strength of 25 Tesla. That's Tesla, the unit used to measure magnetic fields and not, you know, the car. 25 Tesla is half a million times stronger than the Earth's own magnetic field, which seems ridiculously strong, but then remember that we as people living on the surface of the Earth don't even feel the Earth's magnetic fields, and the only way that we ever even do notice it is if we're using an instrument sensitive enough to detect it, like a compass. So to get around these two major problems, Dr. Doofenshmirtz either needs to focus that magnet or find a way to get that magnetic field a heck of a lot closer to those buildings. And bizarrely enough, that is exactly what we see him doing in the show. You heard that right. Dr. Doof is doing the right thing. Thing. I did not expect that. Take another look at the parts of the Magnifinator, namely this tube right here and what looks to be a concentrated magnetic laser beam that he shoots out towards the city. He probably didn't know it at the time, but these are now real things that the most advanced physicists in the world are still working to develop. The first is this magnetic pipe, or hose, which is 100% real. By placing a magnetic field close to the opening of a specialized tube, theoretical physicists, or just theorists, as I like to call them, have actually managed to preserve a magnetic field over a much longer distance than the field would have existed by itself. Right now, they believe they can actually preserve 90% of a magnetic field in a magnetic superconductor hose, transporting magnetism in a way that previously seemed impossible. The other thing that's going on here is potentially even more exciting. Because it doesn't just involve magnets, it also involves lasers, which are just inherently cool. We can see that the Magnifinator doesn't just seem to be a plain old magnetic field generator, it's a laser beam at one end. And once again, Dr. Doof is way ahead of his time, creating what would have been the world's first super magnet laser, something that, as of 2016, is being built for the first time ever. These magnet lasers are pretty much exactly what they sound like. They're ultra-powerful lasers that have the special ability of also creating extremely powerful magnetic fields, thousands of times more powerful than any magnetic field humans have created in the past. Basically, these things would be a lot like Metroid grapple beams. The physics behind them are incredibly complicated, and if you're a Faraday effect aficionado, then I invite you to dive into these things in the comments, but for what we're talking about right now, I'm basically gonna boil it down to the very top level. Lasers, which are basically streams of super energized electrons, they start to get all kinds of special properties as you turn
turn up the intensity of the laser. One of the special properties that starts to happen is radiation friction, or RF. This is basically the friction between electrons at incredibly high energy levels, which gives you more than just atomic rug burn, it actually creates an ultra-powerful magnetic field around the laser beam. Again, this is the made-for-YouTube version of this incredibly advanced science, so if this sounds interesting to you, then have a look at the stuff. It is literally as close as humans are gonna get to magic. Anyway, what you come out of this process with is a magnetic field on the order of 1 billion gauss, which is a big number that doesn't mean a whole lot if we don't have anything to compare it to. So for comparison, an MRI machine creates a magnetic field of 70,000 gauss, which is enough to interfere with pacemakers, metal prosthetics, or any electronics that get near the thing. And this magnetic field is in the billions, basically an astronomic level. You can do things with this level of gauss, like contain nuclear fusion. It's the kind of thing that rivals the magnetic strength of a neutron star. You heard that right. Doof created a device that rivals the power of stars. So yeah, with that kind of magnetism, Dr. Doofenshmirtz could definitely do some serious damage. If you give me another chance, I promise to hurt you in the right way with cartoonish physical violence and elaborate traps constructed out of strange things I've purchased over the internet. Okay, so so far we found a way to make the Magnificator possible, in theory. But here's where it all comes undone. To create what he thinks will be a super strong magnetic attraction, Dr. Doofenshmirtz covers all the skyscrapers on the eastern seaboard with tinfoil. So let's see what happens at the big moment when he thinks he's gonna rip them all up. Oh, the eastern seaboard! They're reversing rotation on the well, that didn't work. You bet it didn't, my little doofle pants. Get your dipole straight, my friend. You created the world's first magnetic hose. You hooked it up to the world's most advanced magnetic laser in history, which can literally harness the power of effing stars. But you forgot one thing, one crucial detail in your entire plot. Tin foil isn't magnetic. While it's certainly true that metals like iron and nickel are attracted to magnets, not all metals are. Ferromagnetism is the property that we use to describe things that are magnetic. What we refer to as tin foil isn't ferromagnetic, and also isn't made of tin, actually. At least not today. Back in the 1800s, actual sheets of tin were commonly used, but when it came to covering food, they left everything they covered with a metallic flavor. Which is why in the 1930s and 40s, tin was replaced with cheaper and tastier aluminum. But while switching to aluminum may help Doof's tuna sandwich stay fresher, it's not gonna help him create mega magnets anytime soon, since neither tin nor aluminum are magnetic. In fact, if anything, covering these buildings in foil is gonna make it harder for the pieces of these buildings that are magnetic, like all the steel and iron supports, to come ripping out. He is literally creating a barrier against his own magnetic laser. And yes, technically iron foil does exist and would be magnetic here, but Dr. Doof specifically said says that he uses tin foil because... I mean, you know, the tin foil alone costs a lot. If you were to upgrade to iron foil to cover even the one city section that we see on screen in the episode, which is just a tiny fraction of the real eastern seaboard, it would cost at least $742,500. And we know realistically that for the entire east coast, he'd have to repeat this dozens to hundreds of different times. So in the end, despite all the resources and incredibly advanced technology Dr. Doofenshmirtz has at his fingertips, from ultra lasers to theoretical physics, his whole plan is undone by not paying attention to the most fundamental rules of magnetism. The stuff that we learn in like third grade. And instead of taking over the world in the very first episode, he gave us four more seasons of Phineas and Ferb science to dissect. So don't worry, we'll have plenty more of his plans to foil over on this channel. So make sure you activate that subscribinator you see on screen right now so you're around as we cover more classic Disney Channel and Nickelodeon shows. Everything from Danny Phantom and Fairly Odd Parents to Drake and Josh and Zack and Cody. Here's our previous Phineas and Ferb episode on the left. And remember, that's just a theory. A film theory. And...